welcome to episode 42 of the How to Japanese podcast. Today I'll be introducing my newsletter for this month, which is about the paragraph level uh, writing technique, Noda, also a spoken technique, and I'll get into that a little bit. I'll also follow up on last month's uh, newsletter about kanji, and then I'll end with a quick review of the new Ghibli anime film, Kimitachi wa Dou Ikiruka, which will be translated into English as The Boy and the Heron. Which I think is, uh, I thought was a reasonable translation at first, and I'll tell you later why I think it's not a great translation now that I've seen the movie. Uh, but first, this month, I'm reading Murakami again. I can't stay mad at him forever, uh, but the Murakami that I've picked up is from the 1980s. I think it's his strongest period of writing, and it's his nonfiction, which is excellent, even up until the present day. Uh, the book is Toi Taiko, uh, Distant Drums, Distant Drumming, Distant Drum. Uh, you could probably translate it a lot of different ways. It's his travel memoir from his time in Europe. He spent three years living in mostly Greece and Italy, but he traveled around a good bit. And it's amazing. It's, it's huge. It's a massive book. Um, I read like half of it at some point when I was in college, I think, uh, or maybe at some point after that. And then kind of have been slowly picking it up and blogging my way through it um, over the last couple of years. It's really cool because he was writing Norwegian Wood as he was traveling. And so you get this really close look at that writing process, the translation he was doing while he was uh, writing Norwegian Wood uh, and the kind of living conditions he was in when this was all happening. This is... He was living out of kind of hotels and little kind of not hostels, but uh, kind of what you might call minshuku in Japan, which are pretty simple, uh, not like ryokan or luxury hotels. Um, and they're they're doing some sightseeing, but not really like heavy, heavily touristy stuff. They're they're living uh, and working in Europe, uh, and it's really cool to see that and who he he runs into and everything like that. Um, but one thing I noticed while I was reading is the grammatical pattern noda, which is extremely subtle and I think imp very difficult to learn how to use well. What it is, is basically you add noda on to the end of a sentence. So you could think of any sentence. So if you think about the, the sentence, I went, itta, you would just add noda onto the end, itta noda. And it, this is used in both spoken and written Japanese. And if you look it up in the dictionary, there's actually a, di a dictionary definition in Japanese for this. And I looked at two different definitions for the newsletter, and they say a couple different things. Uh, the first one is from Kotobank, uh, Kotobank, which is the Nihon Kokugo Daijiten. It's got four definitions. It says the first definition is, shows that facts are being recognized and presented as certain that one is making an assertion or that something is a judgment based on a set of facts, reasons. Uh, that's the kind of definition I'll be looking at, but the other three definitions are two expresses the speaker's determination, three a questions and tense or facts uh, when used with an in interrogative word, and four urges someone to do a certain action. Uh, so that last one, especially you, you're, you might be familiar with in spoken Japanese, so if you said ikunda, uh, that might be a way to say, ask somebody or tell someone to go somewhere. Or nomunda, you drink it, drink it. You know, that's something that you would say in spoken Japanese that could be loosely equivalent to nonde kudasai or nonde, uh, a very casual kind of version of that. And expressing a speaker's determination, too, I think you, you hear it a lot in spoken Japanese. And I remember pretty vividly my third year Japanese teacher kind of forcing us to use it uh, to try and get us to sound natural with spoken Japanese, especially when we were kind of setting up explanation for a story. So say we were talking about, you know, what we did last weekend. I would say, you know, if I, had, if I was talking about, you know, I had gone to Kyoto uh to to meet up with a friend uh or the friend a friend had come into town for the weekend i could say uh tomachi ga senshu matsu kyoto ni ano kite tan da kedo that kite itan da kedo that nda right there is noda kite ita noda 
is what that phrase is. But when you use it in spoken Japanese, it's kiteitan da kedo. That is what you would use it for natural spoken Japanese. You're kind of explaining, emphasizing. It's kind of this very subtle thing, but it's very natural uh, in as a spoken form. But it also gets used in a written form. And that's kind of what I was more interested in this this month. I, I think a lot of the examples I found from Murakami aren't kind of perfect examples of that because it's more casual writing. Uh, you, you see it. Uh, Noda is very interesting and useful in formal writing. And I think you get a kind of clearer picture of what it does grammatically, how it functions grammatically in that kind of context. Whereas with Murakami, it's... Uh, He's writing in the written form, but you see a lot of spoken Japanese kind of um, popping up here and there. Uh, so he'll use an nda every now and then, right? And then he'll also use a noda, which is just kind of like an emphasizer rather than this kind of presenting a judgment based on set of facts or reasons, uh, this kind of logical progression of an argument that noda is... Uh, serving as so um the other definition says basically the same thing this is from the digital daiji sen uh, via gu it says you know noda expresses a declarative thought with emphasized reasoning basis that's a pretty straightforward uh, summary of what noda is doing uh, it also says expresses the speaker's determination or is a request slash cross-examination of someone so it's this kind of Again, an, almost an imperative form, a request slash grilling someone. That's what that nda is doing. Uh, and then the last uh, of the gu definitions is expresses an explanation with emphasis on something, state, or condition. So that kiteitan da kido is expressing an explanation and emphasis on my friend had was in Kyoto and so I went to meet him or something like that. So taking a look at a couple examples from Murakami. So the first one I'll look at is from when he's returning to Greece from Italy. And he starts to kind of notice different backpackers around him from different countries. And he's kind of feels like he's been on the road long enough that he can identify fr where everyone's from, just kind of from their demeanor and the way they look. And so this is what he says about the Northern Europeans. Hoppo Europa jin. So in, in English, this would be Northern Europeans. They travel purely for the sake of hardship, destitution, and penance. This is no lie. Honestly, that's what they're looking for, uh, like pilgrims during the Middle Ages. And so the noda comes in that third sentence. Karera wa honto ni souyu no o motomete iru no da. You could imagine that he could pretty easily end this sentence with just motomete iru. Karera wa honto ni souyu no o motomete iru. And that would be perfectly grammatically acceptable in Japanese. But I have a sense that there would be this kind of like empty void that the reader is might be expecting from the writer here to kind of push that that's what he's he's using that noda for he's he's emphasizing uh and also uh presenting his assertion uh it's not affecting the content per se it's not affecting the the meaning of this of that that pure fact that's being said it's emphasizing how that's being said and how that's being received by the reader or how the writer wants that to be received by the reader, if that makes sense. So you have a, that basic piece of information, but the reader understands that piece of information differently, that this is an assertion that Murakami is making, that he's trying to emphasize it, that it's based on um, the previous statements that have been made. Um, and so that here's one more example before I talk a little bit more about it. Um, this is when he is on a bus somewhere in Greece and the there's a driver, but there's also like a kind of like, I can't remember what the word is, but the, the word he uses, but it's like the 
host of sorts on the bus, kind of like, I guess, making sure everybody's there and things like that. But he breaks out wine and cheese and serves it to everybody on the bus. And it's the best wine and cheese that Murakami's had on the trip. And he says, Shikashi, kono ryoko o tsujite, konna oishi wine o nonda no mo hajimete datta shi, konna oishi cheese o kuchi ni shita no mo hajimete datta. Kore wa kocho de wa nai. Honto ni shinji rare nai kurai oishikatta no da. So you, you get it in that last sentence. Oishikatta no da. Honto ni shinji rare nai kurai oishikatta no da. You could easily, again, in, in that sentence, which is, Honto ni shinji rare nai kurai oishikatta. Or even if you're speaking, Honto ni shinji rare nai kurai oishikatta desu. And that would be perfectly fine Japanese. But again, you're, you're missing something if you're speaking it you would say oishikattan des and that would really kind of emphasize the way you felt about it and the same thing here uh, and the setup is, is almost identical to that other setup he's uh, making a statement he's saying it's not an exaggeration right in the first one he's making a statement he's saying that's not a lie in this case it's not a it's not an exaggeration and then he follows it up with uh something to emphasize it and I think that it's a structure that you can really think about borrowing for your own written Japanese if you're interested in writing more uh, or even or if you're just interested in borrowing this technique for spoken Japanese. Um, it's incredibly useful and I think uh, if you're working on more formal writing, um, something to look into in terms of argumentative writing, in terms of if you're setting up um, a longer explanation or or you have a bunch of examples and then you're kind of coming to the end and making your your kind of itaikoto, what you want to say your point this is the way to kind of mark your point and a lot of my teachers used to say okay you need to add no dot to the end this last sentence or this, this sentence near the end and I don't think it's quite as simple as just saying, you know, the last sentence of all formal writing, argumentative writing in Japanese should have no dot on it. But it, that's often where that's, that's happening, that thesis statement or that summary of that thesis statement or um, wrapping up that line of argumentation gets marked with the no dot. And yeah, I think that's about it for that. You know, I, I think that for me it's really interesting because it's a paragraph level construction because it, it doesn't exist in isolation it's assuming other information around it and it tells you how to think about that information um and so i think when you do see it in writing or when you hear it you it's good to kind of like take a pause do a timeout and say okay what's going on here um if you can kind of remind yourself to do that it's hard to do that in the moment sometimes i think um but a really useful skill to have while you're reading if you're looking to kind of be an active reader and take some language from what you're reading so that you can then go use it yourself um and then the the one other example of that that i found was this really awesome sentence that murakami they are heading back to greece but they don't go all the way to athens in one day they stop in this a city called Patras. I don't know how to, exactly how to pronounce it, but in Japanese it's Patras. And he says, Patras no machi ni tomari takute tomatta wake de wa nai. Patras no machi ni tomari takute tomatta wake de wa nai. We didn't stay in Patras because we wanted to. So this I thought was just a great sentence. You can kind of break it down and you can reuse it in so many different ways ways right you could say ikitakute itta wake de wa nai i didn't go because i wanted to nomitakute nonda wake de wa nai i didn't drink maybe the barium for your health check because i wanted to i had to drink it because of the health check mudori takute modotta wake de wa nai i didn't go back because i wanted to i went back for some other reason and this sentence i thought was really interesting too because it's again another ex explanatory uh construction with the wake uh it's contextual in that it doesn't make any sense on its own it's 
it's got other context, it's a junction between two ideas. There's an assumption that's being made on one side and you're trying to explain how that assumption is not the case. And this sentence gets you there in a really nice way. And so if you can be an active reader, an active listener of Japanese and extract these sentences and then reuse them, I think that's an incredible skill to have. Um, and one that takes, I think, training while you're doing something passive like reading or listening. Um, so again, I think this kind of touches back on last month about the kanji, you know, what can you do to make your kanji more active? Um, you, you need to be thinking about what, what can you do to make your study of the language active? Um, and uh, that's tough, but I think something to, to constantly be thinking about. Um, and then one last detail of the not the no da before I forget, which is that sentences will sometimes end with a, a noun, right? So, you know, uh, getsuyobi this, that means it's Monday, right? You could, you wouldn't say getsuyobi no des, right? You, you can end the sentence with a noun and no da, except in that case, the no becomes a na, it shifts to na. So getsuyobi na no da. The, there's a na between the noun uh, and the no da. And there is another uh, Murakami example that I look at in the newsletter. I'll save that one for, for, for the newsletter. Go, go give it a read. Um, but uh, Murakami is telling another great story about a hotel where he stayed. And he uses a noun plus na no da uh, at the end of the sentence as a way to kind of emphasize a, an assertion so that's all i have for i think that part of the newsletter uh for this month um i did want to uh, get back to last month briefly i heard from a reader uh thanks so much for all the comments and emails uh the reader wrote in with a really great suggestion about anki there's a way you can use something called a filter deck um I haven't looked too closely at it, but, but essentially what it does is that it takes all the cards you have due and it makes a separate deck of those. And then you can work through that independently before adding new cards uh, to what you're working on. And that's kind of basically what I was doing on my own. I was basically kind of um, dialing up and down the number of new cards per day. I would turn it I would do, I think, probably, you know, whatever, 20 to 40 new cards, which was, you know, 5 to 10 new kanji every day, or however many it was, 10 to 20 new kanji every day. And then I would review those, and then I would set it to zero. And that way, I would be just reviewing the old cards after that, at that point. And I currently, at this point, or when I was still working through my kanji deck, I had it set to zero just once I had basically finished the deck. The deck I was working on was from a textbook and they had, it was really well constructed. All the, it was perfect. The, if you're working through that kanji in context textbook, that's the perfect deck to work on because it's all set up in order. You go through the uh, cards in the same order as the textbook and it goes through all the core examples and then after you finish all the core examples of the uh, kanji, which is the kanji themselves and all the main examples, it starts giving you the kind of very obscure readings for some of the kanjis, which aren't required. They're kind of like bonus. And I was glad that he marked those because at IUC, they only really make you learn or memorize the, the kind of basic ones. Um, and so there are, you know, I don't know exactly how many cards, probably another several hundred or a thousand cards in that deck, but I just basically turned it off and was using it to kind of um, maintain my kanji practice. Unfortunately, uh, that has not, I did not really pick that back up this, this month. I've been kind of doing other things. I've been doing some reading in English. Uh, in, a new translation of You Midi came out uh, by Morgan Giles uh, the end of August. I've been trying to work through that. Uh, a new book by a uh, former JET teacher, uh, Cleo Chien, 
called Let's Go, Let's Go, Let's Go came out, a book of short stories. I've been been working on that. Uh, I've been playing a lot of Street Fighter VI and Elden Ring. And, you know, unfortunately, there's just limited time in the day. And, and for me right now, kanji aren't a priority. And I think that's okay to do sometimes. I think it's okay to kind of um, let yourself take a step back from certain things. But also at the same time, knowing that the only way you get through something is by being consistent and prioritizing it and i think it's okay to say this is not my priority right now right now or this is my priority right now you know i used to think that i wasn't a good reader that i was a slow reader um and i think i learned that that wasn't true at some point in the mid 2015 16 that i just started reading bigger books more consistently so i got through the savage detectives i got through all the neapolitan novels i got through the first three Neapolitan novels twice uh, by Elena Ferrante. If you haven't read those, they're fantastic. Um, but it takes a kind of mindset, I think. And that same thing is true with language study. You just need to say, okay, I'm going to put down everything else and I'm going to prioritize this for now. And even if that just means a little bit every day, I'm going to make time for that. And, you know do whatever it takes to buy myself a little bit of time to do kanji or to do this or that. And so for me, that's been a few other things this past month, I think. Um, so I do need to find, a, to make a little bit more room, I think, in my life for some Japanese study. Uh, and that's something I'm co co cognizant of. Uh, but at, at the moment, I think I'm comfortable uh, having it not be kanji, that I'm ready to kind of move towards something else. And I think that's it. I'll I'll do my quick review of Kimi Tachi wa Dou Ikiruka. It's going to be basically spoiler free um, because to be honest, I don't remember much of what happens. Um, I'll save the, the one, I guess, minor, minor, minor content related comment for the very, very end. But my overall review is that I didn't think it was very good. Uh, the, my main issue with it was that it's too novelistic. Uh, which I thought, you know, happened to a lot of these Ghibli movies. They just felt really crammed into two hours. And it's not unique to Ghibli movies. That happens to a lot of American Hollywood movies. It, it's a rush. Uh, they're trying to get through too much in too little time. Uh, I think a movie should be a short story uh, in scope. And I think these prestige TV shows that we have been watching for the last two decades are the space for more novelistic storytelling and unfortunately that that was felt really true with kimitachi wa do ikiruka there's too many uh characters and ideas and kind of even techniques i think that get short uh thrift because it's just you know two hours and change and they're really cramming everything in um it felt like the ending was really rushed. Uh, and the first 20 minutes I thought were incredible, really, really interesting and great. And um, I mean, the one content thing that I'll say that I think, you know, has been said on a lot of other podcasts is that it's uh, set in World War II and you see a part of World War II from the point of a, uh, of someone in Tokyo that you might not have seen before, um, which is interesting. I think, you know, Grave of the Fireflies would be another interesting, obviously another interesting anime to look at that I haven't seen in, in years and years and years, so I can't really remember it. But this is a, a slightly different perspective, I think. And it jumps away from that, I think, you know, as you might expect from a Ghibli movie, it jumps away from reality pretty significantly. But yeah, I don't know. I was I came away disappointed. Um, I enjoyed the um, Suzume no Tojimari, Tojimari, uh, much, 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 much more uh, than uh, than this one. And I guess you know it's it wasn't like I wouldn't call it novelistic in scope, but it, maybe it would work as a short story with enough uh, if you condensed enough of the kind of narrative i would say 
but it's not exactly a short. It, it's got a. I think it was a good balance in terms of like what it set out to do as a story, whereas this one just really bit off a lot and was going for a more epic feel. Um, and I think just didn't, unfortunately, didn't do it. Yeah, Totoro strikes strikes me as basically the perfect. A Ghibli a movie, basically a short story in scope, um, filled out to a, a feature length film. So, and that's all I got this month. I hope you all are staying inside and keeping cool like I am. If you're interested in playing me in Street Fighter VI, add me. Uh, my username is the Daniel Morales. That's I just use that for Street Fighter. So if you're looking for other uh playstation uh connections you can add me at how to japanese i think with an o like my original website um and yeah find me on twitter instagram i'm on blue sky threads i'm not posting that much i'm trying to post regularly on twitter and blue sky at this point um read the newsletter check out the website and look forward to september i do uh murakami fest in september um Every week I put up a blog post looking at some unpublished translation of his. And this month I'm back looking at Distant Drums. We looked at a little bit this month in the newsletter and in the podcast. And I'll be taking a closer look at where Murakami was traveling uh, during this time, right around the time when he's when uh, Norwegian Wood is going to press. So very, very interesting uh, stuff. And I hope you all check it out. Talk to you again soon.